Yes, Anshula is going to introduce. Uh, Namaste and good evening. I, Chavi Jain, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a special talk on asymmetric prime dynamics and social interactions. This discussion is a part of the series Hashtag Gender Gaps, organized by IMPRI, Gender Impact Studies Center. It is my privilege to introduce the chair for the session, Professor Govind Kalkar. Ma'am is the executive director at GenDev Center for Research and Innovation, Gurugram. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Rubin. Dr. Rubin, obtained his PhD in economics at University College London and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Economics at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Sir is affiliated to the Erasmus Center for Economic and Financial Governance and is also a candidate fellow at the Tinbergen Institute. He works on topics such as interaction, intersection of political economy, development economics, and law and economics, and uses a theoretical and empirical approach to study questions on unethical behavior, corruption, abuse of power, discrimination, crime, and also elections. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, Chavi. Thank you, Chavi. Our discussants for today are Dr. Anand Srivastava, who is a professor at School of Arts and Sciences, Azim Premji University, Bangalore, and Dr. Renuka Sani, who is an assistant professor at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, Delhi. Thank you for joining us, sir and ma'am. Now, I invite our chair, Professor Govin Kalko, to give her introductory remarks and proceed with the deliberation. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you very much for this very generous and very adequate introduction of the speaker. And we look forward to today's discussion. Very, very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Ruben uh, Pavilete and Sajenova or Neva. Mm. Uh, objective of today's discussion is the nexus between social interaction and reduction in crimes. And uh, that is uh, one of the things that I rapidly read your work, but uh, I am not so sure if I'm misrepresenting you, but we will hear you. So that would be the uh, kind of uh, this thing. This is very important to understand the human beings and human interaction, particularly in the, when that person is withdrawn from the social in social sphere because otherwise we are called social beings men, women or men but strangely this thing this study is very important because it takes kind of a pandemic situation and it talks about that when people are withdrawn to stay home then how they behave uh, and uh, whether they behave in terms of why there is a reduction in crime at that time our data in gender studies may be different, but the study by itself is very, very important. And what really we found out during the um, coronavirus period or during the lockdown, India has the largest lockdown, as you yourself presented kind of, and very strict one for, in the initial years. And that we have a we have lot of crimes. Who were, the, who were these people who were criminals in that sense? But, and who were the perpetrators of these crimes and who were the people who were affected? We will come to that later when, but one thing is clear that probably in public violence, we have not done so much. So your theory with regard to if it is public violence and public kind of crimes, it may be very, very correct. So we really look forward to hearing you. Uh, with a lot of attention, uh, Dr. Rubik, Ruben, 
and a very pleased, very, very pleased and very, very warm welcome in this cold Delhi, but not so cold. <laughs> but anyway, it's online, so we can be, uh, we can be pleased to, you will make us really warm at heart and warm in mind. Look forward to, so over to you, Dr. Ruben. Well, thank you very much uh, all for uh, the invitation and for the, the kind words <laughs> uh, for the presentation uh, and the discussions again for uh, being here uh, uh, had the availability to discuss uh, this project. So let me start uh, sharing uh, my screen. Okay. Can you all see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, so the yes, project that I'm going to the project that I'm going to uh, present uh, today is about uh, uh, asymmetric like, crime dynamics and, and social interaction. So as you know, uh, the social economic consequences of crime are quite significant for our society in terms of the amount of money that government spend in preventing crime, fighting crime uh, in terms of imprisonment, and also the amount of money that uh, individuals uh, spend for preventing crime and the uh, social uh, psychological consequences that the uh, cost can have on this. So uh, I'm on, because of this, it's very important to have a clear understanding of what are the main drivers of criminal behavior in order to be uh, able to produce uh, good policies to prevent crime. One of the uh, important uh, characteristics of many criminal uh, crimes is that a lot of them depends on the physical interaction between a victim and a perpetrator. So in these cases, if a, a criminal cannot find a victim, some sort of crime simply cannot be committed, okay? So despite this fact, uh, there have been little attention uh, on certain type of policies that might alter social interaction opportunities as a crime preventing tool. So what I'm gonna uh, do in this project and show you in this presentation is that I'm gonna study the, the role of social interactions on crime by using uh, the, the, the natural experiment of lockdowns. And one important thing to take into account, as most of you know already, is that lockdown uh, affected several different variables. And most of these variables, a lot of these variables can impact uh, criminal activity in different ways. So one of the main important contribution of this paper is to uh, try to disentangle among these uh, very different uh, mechanisms to explain what are the main important factors that uh, affect uh, uh, crime. And a second important point is uh, studying the dynamic effect of lockdown on crime. Uh, not many papers have been analyzing uh, what are the long-term consequences of, of, of the lockdown. Uh, and here I'm going to put some uh, evidence in terms of the uh, of crime. And mostly we're going to have uh, some new insights on what are the criminal uh, motives and behavior. Uh, the setting of the study is India, and as uh, Professor Gomin already highlighted, uh, would suffer the, the, the biggest lockdown in the world at some point. And we're gonna use uh, the, the, um, the case of Bihar, which uh, has a sudden announcement uh, with the immediate effect uh, uh, of the lockdown. Just to uh, highlight you what are the main findings so, so you can have a, a clear point where we are going. Uh, first, uh, one of the main findings is that uh, lockdowns actually reduce criminal activity. And the main driver of this uh, crime drop seems to be driven by the, the low chances of a criminal victim encounter, okay? In terms of the, the how crime evolved, uh, we observe different crime uh, patterns depending on the, on the characteristics of the crime. So evidence suggests that there's temporal displacement for, for property crimes, but there's no uh, temporal displacement for personal crimes. In this sense, uh, the lockdown uh, presented little societal benefits of, uh, on uh, the reduction of property crimes since most of them were just uh, committed uh, once the, uh, the lockdowns restrictions were eased. Uh, on the other hand, personal crimes not committed won't be committed in the future. And that's something that, uh, that is new uh, that we didn't know in the literature and provides some insights on uh, how criminals intertemporal behavior uh, uh, occurred uh, for different types of crimes. So uh, let me give you an overview of the presentation. Uh, first, I'm gonna start uh, discussing what are the conceptual framework of how lockdowns impact criminal activity. I'm briefly discussing the, the, the context of Bihar. Uh, and then the presentation is gonna have two parts. One is gonna uh, be focused on um, capturing the immediate impact of lockdown on crime and discussing what are the main mechanisms underlying 
this change in, in crime. And the second is going to be about um, the evolution of crime uh, during a, a, a larger amount of, uh, of periods. And finally, I'm going to uh, uh, finalize with uh, some takeaways. So let's go for the conceptual framework. Uh, as I said before, um, lockdowns uh, affect uh, criminal behavior in different ways. Uh, there are several channels by which lockdown might affect this. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the impact on crime is uncertain, given that most of some of these channels increase and some of other decrease uh, criminal activity. One of the important points uh, is that the main goal of the lockdown, by definition, is to prevent social encounters. Okay, So this uh, reduction in social encounters implies that there's less people on the streets. The fact that there's less people on the streets can have uh, a different impacts on crime. On the one hand, uh, it makes much more difficult for criminals to find victims. So this basically, in, uh, the, the lack of people in the streets increase criminals' uh, search costs which at the end uh, reduce criminal activity. On the other hand, uh, the lockdown might have a, a, a direct self-incapacitation effects on criminals in the sense that they might uh, comply with the lockdown and stay at home or might be, uh, have some certain fears of the virus so they're not uh, going at home, uh, for the streets. Or even uh, maybe a disruptive behavior of, of criminals in the sense that if they don't see people on the street, uh, there's no point going out, okay? So any of these reasons may imply that the, the lack of criminals in the street uh, might decrease, by definition, uh, uh, the amount of crime committed. On the other hand, there's a, a, an opposite effect of, uh, of the fact that we observe less people on the street, and is given by the fact that, we, that there are less witnesses. And the fact that there's less, less witnesses in the street, it will increase crime give condition on the, uh, a criminal uh, finding uh, a particular victim. One of another important um, point that we have to take into account is that in most, most countries in the world, uh, the lockdown in order to be implemented require uh, police resources to do so. So this has a, a very important impact on police behavior. And there might be two different channels by how which uh, affects crime. On one hand, uh, there, there's a large uh, diversion of resources that were uh, um, from crime reduction to lock, uh, lockdown enforcement. And there's uh, several anecdotal accounts suggesting that at the very end, police uh, were overburdened uh, with, uh, with doing the lockdown, which affect directly the, the capacity for them to fight criminal activity. I'm gonna present evidence uh, along this line uh, later on. Uh, however, there's another effect uh, through which uh, police might impact crime. Uh, lockdowns, Okay, require police uh, officers to be on the streets. So there's high police deployment, uh, particularly in certain uh, previously crowded areas. So this might uh, deter uh, criminals to commit certain type of crimes, particularly crimes that occur in public places. Okay, and finally, uh, there are two other points that we want to take into account. One is the fact that lockdowns might have an important effect on labor market condition. Uh, most of this effect is not necessarily immediate, uh, as you were seeing uh, uh, as the longer progress, uh, labor market conditions were uh, worse off, not only in India, uh, but in, in most countries occur that. And this might drive uh, several individuals to engage in criminal activity, particularly uh, property crimes, okay? Uh, and finally, um, even if we observe a decrease in crime, this might not be cause of a true crime reduction. This might be uh, because we observed uh, a less amount of crimes that are reported. So uh, a might could have affected uh, the under-reporting of, uh, of several types of cases. And I'm gonna explain uh, more uh, some of this uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so regarding the lockdown, uh, what we observed is that um, we're gonna analyze the case of Bihar. So as I said before, the, the, the chief minister uh, of Bihar uh, announced, uh, make a sudden announcement, uh, which was with the immediate effect uh, of the lockdown during the 22nd of March in 2020 last year. And as at the beginning, as you all know, uh, the, there were very strict uh, restrictions, uh, not only in Bihar, uh, among the whole country, in terms of uh, what people can do or not. Um, as the lockdown progressed, uh, there were implemented different uh, phases 
uh, where different restrictions were applied in different districts uh, across the country. One important uh, thing that we want to highlight is the fact that uh, a lot of um, a lot of the police uh, in India, police um, enforcement agencies in India, were quite overburdened uh, doing the, uh, the enforcement of the lockdown. And this is particularly the case for for Bihar, which has one of the lowest uh, police officer rate uh, to population ratio in India. So just to uh, mention this, uh, for the Bihar, the number of police officers per 100,000 people is about uh, 80, um, 81, which is almost half the, the amount of um, police officers in, uh, in, in that branch of, of the country. Uh, additionally, um, police officers were working a lot of hours, and this amount of hours increased substantially during the period of the lockdown. So nearly 80% of the police officers were working more than 11 hours, where and, and even 30% of the police officers were working more than 15 hours a day. So this might have a very important impacts on police performance. Uh, so in order to analyze this, I'm gonna also, um, I captured, uh, I gathered information about arrests for over or nearly 200 police stations in order to analyze how the lockdown impacted uh, police performance. In terms of criminal activity, uh, I gather information coming from the first information reports uh, for over 850 police stations in Bihar. So we have information about the registration and the incident states, and particularly uh, is, uh, I classified um, criminal cases uh, using the Indian penal codes. And this uh, the analysis across different criminal cases would be very useful in order to um, disentangle what are the, the main mechanisms driving the, the, the main results. One final thing that I want to highlight uh, in the case of uh, Bihar, that uh, the police have made have made, uh, have made a lot of efforts in the last few years uh, to make uh, the reporting easy and, and more accessible to the people. And here in Bihar, uh, the reporting can also be done online. So this, at some point, uh, reduced the, the problem of, of uh, underreporting, at least for people who have access to, uh, to, um, to computers or, or cell phones with internet. Okay, so let me uh, start showing a little bit of data. So in this graph, we have uh, the mobility uh, and some, and, and also the number of crimes. So the so the um, these black dots that you observe are the daily average crimes per hundred thousand people at the police station level, and this uh, line, solid line that you observe, is the Google Mobility Index which as you can see at the moment of the imposition of the lockdown, uh, there's a large decrease in the mobility index. So people were basically, uh, most of them were staying at home. Uh, and as the lockdown progressed uh, and the, the different restrictions were imposed, the people were coming up uh, to the streets. So they were less compliant with the lockdown. And as you can see that actually there's a high correlation between the number of, uh, of crimes committed uh, per day and the amount of people that were going around the streets. Uh, as, as you can see, right, there's a large decrease in crimes and the aggregate crimes at the moment of the imposition of the lockdown. Uh, however, this might, uh, might be driven by other characteristics that are changing at the same time. Right? So in order to identify uh, the impact of the lockdowns on criminal activity, I'm gonna use a, a regression discontinuity in design, uh, basically using the, the time as a continuous variable. Uh, so the crucial point is to, the idea is to compare uh, crimes that were committed, the number of crimes that were committed just before the lockdown versus those crimes, the number of crimes that were committed just after the lockdown. And the crucial part is that we have to take into account other variables that are affecting crimes and might be a, a, a changing in time. So in order to take into account that, uh, I'm gonna uh, control for other characteristics that may have, that affect, uh, that affect uh, crime and have been suggested by the literature, such as the, the I include um, day of the week's fixed effects, given that um, crimes during the weekends are much higher than during the weekdays, and also control for uh, the amount of rainfall and temperature that, that also the literature suggests that affect uh, criminal uh, activity. So let me uh, go directly to the, the first result. So here we have uh, 
the immediate impact of lockdowns on criminal activity. So as you can see, uh, the first column is the main res is the result for the aggregate crimes. Uh, so at the moment of the position of the lockdown, we observed a large decrease in the aggregate crimes. And this is about a 60% reduction due to the position of the lockdown. We observed also a large effects across all the board for different types of criminal cases. Uh, for instance, in the case of property crimes, such as thefts, burglaries, and robberies, there's also a large decrease of them, uh, ranging between a 40% decrease to 61% decrease. Uh, similarly, for personal crimes, uh, such as murder, kidnapping, again, and violence against women, there's large uh, drops in, in criminal activity. Uh, one thing that I want to mention, uh, given the context of this presentation, is uh, uh, puts a little bit of focus on uh, crimes against women. So a lot of uh, the literature uh, analyzing the impacts of lockdowns on, 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 on crimes against women has been focusing on domestic violence, right? Uh, and most of the evidence for several countries have suggested there has been an increase in domestic violence during the period of the lockdown. However, there's also a, a positive uh, uh, consequences of the, of the lockdown in terms of the, um, violence against women, uh, particularly uh, as, as we can show here for Bihar. Let me uh, just be precise about this. So these uh, crimes against women are mainly uh, assaults that occur in public places, given that uh, all this information are coming from uh, the first information reports. And as you know, uh, these, uh, there are sensitive cases such as domestic violence cases that are not uh, publicly reported, okay? So at least we can observe that the lockdown reduced severely the amount of uh, crimes against women, uh, basically uh, assaults in the streets. Uh, additionally, we observed a large decrease in the number of people uh, protesting in the streets. And this has uh, important consequences in terms of the reporting of the, of the police. Most of these cases, uh, well, the, the, the writing, uh, the, the, the crimes against women, um, the writing cases are reported by the police. So the accuracy of these cases in terms of the reporting are, are quite high. Okay, as you can see, uh, lockdown reduced criminal activity, not only at the aggregate crime, but also uh, across the board. So now the question is uh, why, what is the main factor that drives this reduction in crime? And here the most likely reason is given by the uh, low chances of a criminal victim encounter. Out of all the, the, the channels that I presented at the very beginning in the conceptual framework, the low chances for a criminal victim encounter uh, can uh, explain the decrease in crime for all these uh, types of criminal, uh, criminal cases, okay? Regardless of the, the, the type of nature and the location where they uh, are presented. So one thing is, uh, that is important is that we observe a net negative uh, effect of the lockdown on crime. So this allows us to first uh, discard certain channels that increase criminal activity. It doesn't mean necessarily that these channels are not present there. It means that they are not the main reason why we observe this net decrease in crime. However, there's other potential explanations uh, about this crime reduction. So here uh, in this table, we have uh, the, the different type of criminal cases and the reduction that was estimated and how these arrows represent how the law that might impact this uh, type of um, cases depending on the mechanism that we're taking into account. And finally here, I'm uh, putting whether the criminal cases are mostly occurred in public places or not. So the other potential options that might uh, explain why we have started a decrease in crime can be, uh, uh, can be due to a high police uh, uh, deployment in the street. Given the evidence uh, that, I, uh, that we already observed and something that I'm gonna show in the next slide, I think this uh, is unlikely to be the main reason to, uh, for explaining all this uh, large decrease in most of in all these crimes. First of all, there's a, a large uh, theoretical and empirical literature showing that uh, police deployment has no effects of any uh, type of crimes that occurred in private dwellings. So for instance, in the case of murders, most of the murders occurred in private homes and, and police uh, officers, uh, the literature have never found that they have an impact in preventing crimes, uh, let alone uh, observing uh, the criminal, uh, the, the murders when they occurred. Uh, additionally, uh, so this basically, the police department is not a good explanation to explaining uh, the decrease in burglaries and, and murders. Additionally, uh, the capacity of the police in uh, in fighting crime 
was severely reduced during the period of the lockdown. Uh, using the data that I uh, mentioned before in terms of arrests, the number of uh, the share of the arrests at the moment of the imposition of the lockdown were decreased in about 80%, suggesting that the police didn't have like the, uh, didn't have the, 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 the capacity to, to, to fight criminal activity as it used to be before the lockdown. In terms of the reporting, uh, it's unlikely that this also is the main reason for this decrease in crime, particularly a certain type of criminal cases such as a murder, for instance, uh, or, or riots, as I mentioned before, uh, are quite accurately uh, reported. Uh, so this kind of explains the, 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 the reason for this uh, drop in criminal cases. And something additional uh, that we can do is to analyze how uh, complainants' behavior changes do, because of the lockdown. So what I do in that uh, in, in that case, analyze uh, the de the delays, how many days it took from the incidence of the crime until the the reporting of the crime. And if anything, what we observe is that uh, the the number of uh, days that pass between the incidence of the crime until the reporting of the crime uh, decreased during the lockdown. And this might be driven by the fact that the lockdown uh, re reduced considerably the, the productivity of, of, of time in the sense that uh, people were uh, basically staying uh, at home. So they didn't have not many other activities uh, in, in, in what to use their time. So there's not much evidence to suggest that reporting might be the main reason uh, to this uh, large uh, crime drop. Uh, let me show you uh, this uh, additional evidence uh, going in, in, in lines with uh, the, the main mechanisms. So if we analyze, for instance, that the police department might have an impact on criminal activity, then what we, we, we would observe is that in district with a high uh, police capacity, those districts that have high police capacity will be more effective in fighting crime as opposed to district with uh, lower police capacity. Um, having data about the, uh, the police uh, capacity at the police station level is quite hard. So what I do is I collect information about um, the number of judges uh, at the district level and the number of police station at the district level, which is highly correlated with the number of police officers, at least when we observe information at the state level. And what we observe is that when we separate a district that have high police capacity versus low police capacity, we do not observe any significant differences among this uh, district. And if anything, we observe a, a, a little bit larger uh, effects of this to have lower uh, police strength. So this evidence uh, go in line that, uh, that uh, police strength or police deployment might not be the main reason for this uh, crime drop. Uh, in the case of, um, of the probability of a criminal victim matching, on the other hand, what we can look is uh, what happened with the compliance. So the idea is the following. In this is where there's low compliance, meaning that there's like a lot of individuals going in the streets, we might observe a lower decrease in, in criminal activity as opposed to criminal, uh, as opposed to district, which have a high compliance. So in order to do this, what I use is, um, I use as, as a measure of compliance, the, 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 the share of crimes against public health. One thing that we have to take into account is that the crimes against public health are basically uh, cases where the police see many people in the street during the lockdown, and they should be in the street. Okay, so they, uh, uh, these people are charged uh, against uh, uh, this uh, public health. Okay, so uh, one thing that is uh, it's important to take account is that, uh, yes, this measure might be correlated with the police strength. Uh, however, I do not find any uh, evidence that the police strength is correlated at all with the compliance with the lockdown. Okay, so this is a, a measure better for the compliance with the lockdown, and it's not correlated necessarily with the uh, with the police strength. And when you and what you can see when you separate this with high compliance versus low compliance, evidence is going in the, in the direction that places that have low compliance, meaning more people on the street, have a lower reduction in, the, in, the, in, in crime compared to places with high compliance. Okay, so this may suggest that the probability of a victim, a uh, criminal victim encounter, might be the uh, main driver of, uh, of the crime drop. Uh, finally, I want to highlight, uh, uh, I want to mention some stuff about the crime dynamics. Uh, first, uh, lockdown, as you know, uh, affect the cost of crime across time and location. 
So it's important to understand whether criminals postpone these crimes, what the load and restriction are risk or not. Uh, the only part that I want to highlight is this graph. I don't want to crowd you out uh, with a lot of information. So let me just explain this uh, following uh, um, figure. So here we have the estimates of the impact uh, on criminal activity for different uh, as the long progress. Okay, so uh, as you can see, for instance, uh, here we separate uh, for crimes uh, for property crimes and personal crimes. And what you observe at the beginning is the initial impact of the of the lockdown on criminal activity. This is consistent with the evidence that I showed before, right? There's a large reduction in both of these crimes. However, as the lockdown progressed, the impact of the lockdown on this type of crimes uh, were reduced and almost disappeared uh, by uh, week five or week seven, depending on the type of crime. Uh, particularly in terms of the personal crimes, as you can see in this orange. Uh, Dots. What we can see is that all these crimes, all these personal crimes, uh, return to the pre-lockdown level after seven weeks, and there's uh, and they stay uh, at the pre-lockdown level, which means basically that the lockdown prevented a certain amount of uh, kidnapping, a certain amount of uh, murders, and these murders were not compensated once the lockdowns and restrictions were eased. On the other hand, uh, property crimes, what we observe that they re return to pre-lockdown level more or less at the same time. However, they go over and above uh, the pre-lockdown level. So this can mean uh, two things. One is there's temporal displacement, meaning that all the criminal cases that were not committed in the first few weeks, they're postponed afterwards when, there is, uh, when the, the restrictions were eased, or they're more the, the, the bad labor market outcome, right? Push uh, new individuals to engage in criminal activity. Okay, uh, basically, uh, I don't have time to show you the results. But when you compare uh, districts that were very, that were severely affected by um, by labor market outcomes, such as the amount of unemployment or the amount of uh, migrants that were arriving uh, to the district and they didn't have any job, you observe similar evolution of property crimes amongst these two. Uh, type of, of districts, suggesting that uh, the amount of new criminals are not the main reasons for this jump uh, in after after seven or, or, or eight weeks. Uh, so uh, potentially the the biggest reason for this uh, increase or overshooting in property crimes are due to uh, temporal displacement. Okay, so let me just go uh, with the main takeaways. So first of all, this paper shows that the lockdowns decrease criminal activity, okay? But the more importantly, why is the reason to observe this large, uh, large uh, crime drop? What can we learn from this? Uh, and what can we use uh, for future public policies? So uh, this large reduction in crime uh, was due to uh, a reducing, what uh, was due to a lower chances of a criminal victim encounter. So different type of policies that might go in this direction might be quite effective in reducing crime. Uh, think about, for instance, uh, the case of curfews uh, that, do, that are imposed during the night. Uh, however, importantly is, uh, is to take into account what are the true effects the, of these policies on certain type of criminal cases. Particularly what, I, what, what we observe is that um, these type of policies are effective in preventing uh, personal crimes as these were not displaced afterwards. So basically, this uh, uh, reducing uh, the chances of a criminal victim encounter reduce a certain amount of murders now, and they are not compensated afterwards. Meaning basically that if I don't murder somebody today, it's not that uh, I'm going to murder two people tomorrow. Okay, this doesn't happen for this type of personal crime. On the other hand, for property crimes, but we observe that uh, this uh, type of policies deter criminal activity for property crimes only temporary. But at the very end, uh, there's a, a, an increase in, in property crimes uh, afterwards. So uh, let me uh, finish with that uh, so I don't crowd out all the time. Uh, so uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ivan. It was a really very well kind of uh, cohesive presentation uh, in terms of both data and your analysis. So we'll come back to you. I would uh, request uh, the two discussants 
to give their uh, opinion on the piece and whatever they want to say. So Dr. Anand Srivastava, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Govind. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I'll quickly share a very few slides um, about the response. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, it's a really nice, uh, a very interesting work, asking a very interesting question. The identification technique of the uh, uh, you know lockdown is is really interesting and i think potentially you know there are other questions also can be that can be answered using this particular uh, identification and of course the data set of uh, you know firs uh, is is really unique and again you know many potential other questions can can be asked i think it's very interesting uh, line of research and the results are are, are intuitive i think there's uh, it, it definitely makes sense what you what you find and, and they're quite substantive in terms of the size. Um, to really like the paper, I have a few comments and suggestions and two main points. Uh, the first part is about, as you may expect, is about the underreporting. So uh, the key assumption is that the, so basically what we're observing are FIRs, right? And the key assumption is that the probability that an FIR is filed conditional on the crime having been committed is not changing with the treatment, it's not changing with the lockdown. We know that this probability is definitely less than one and that it will be different for different kinds of crime. And so this becomes, as, as you've correctly pointed out, more of a concern, not for things like rioting and murders, where it's likely to be reported, but for things like crimes against women and property crimes, uh, where this reporting rate may be subject to change. Right. And the online reporting is nice, but I think it doesn't really, in this case, have much of an impact. Bihar has a really low internet penetration rate. So unless we see that most of this thing is online, we uh, don't really work. I mean, the one thing that I think you can do to substantiate, I mean, the overall argument makes sense that, you know, this cannot explain everything that you're finding. But if the result also is about each of the individual things, then, you know, there is a concern that this could be explaining a lot of the uh, 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 impact in these particular kinds of crimes, the crimes against women and property crimes. So the delay thing is, is very interesting, you know, what you find that the delay goes down. And I was just thinking whether there was a way to use that. So this is just off the top of my head, but maybe you can explore. Uh, if we assume that, you know, the, re the relationship between delay and the probability of reporting the crime remains the same. So if I report it immediately, I'm more likely to report it. And if I'm waiting for 10 days, I'm going, it's less likely that the crime will be reported. Then, during the lockdown, maybe the people who were going to report it quickly go on and report it. And people who would have otherwise taken a time are the people who maybe live very far away from the police station, are poorer, and those are the people who are not reporting. Um, so if you assume that this relationship does not change, that people who would, are able to report it quicker are more likely to report, people who report after a long time are less likely to report. Um, maybe the new distribution of delay that you find post lockdown can be used to estimate under reporting and correct your um, uh, uh, estimates for that. I still believe that you will find an effect, but you can do some sort of a correction. Um, the second point, that, uh, main point I had was the temporal displacement. Again, I believe that I think it makes sense that that happens, but can we completely discount the possibility of new crimes being committed because of the impact of lockdown? I think the Low and high unemployment story does not is not very convincing because I don't think in the Indian context unemployment is a driver of crime. Like unemployment is actually being driven by people who can afford to not say stay employed. Right? These are people who are actively looking for work. Um, so you know you could think of you know if there was there was some way if it was some variable that you know is a driver of crime. So I don't know maybe youth. I, mean, I have not seen this literature but maybe youth unemployment is more of a driver of a crime or inequal income inequalities is more of a driver of crime. Um, uh, you know, if you can use some of these um, uh, uh, variables, um, uh, I think the case will be uh, much stronger. And there's a number of uh, minor points. I don't want to spend uh, uh, too much time on it. The only one point that I'll, I'll send this to, to Ruben, of course, um, is this, uh, the, uh, you don't have the police personnel per capita and you're using number of judges. It's, it, I know you find it in other data set that is quite correlated, but to me, it seems that it could be, then that could be reflecting many things, you know, administrative capacity, so many other things it may not be about police personnel. Uh, but I mean, I don't have a good suggestion on what else 
uh, you can do that, but I'm just highlighting that some of these things you may need to find other ways to reinforce if they're a, strong, a kind of main part of your story. So those were all the uh, suggestions I had. I think it was a great uh, presentation. I look forward to how it develops in the future. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic paper. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Anand Srivastava. I uh, one would agree with a lot of your suggestions. And I think Dr. Rivan also would then take them positively in order to further improve. Uh, that is the whole purpose of the being a discussant is there. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Sahini, uh, Dr. Sinha, or no, Dr. Renuka Sahini. Where are Hello. You? Yeah, this is, I'm Renuka Sahini. Sorry, Dr. Renuka, I, I, you noted your name and then I was looking where I noted. No problem at all. Uh, please, pardon me. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you for, to the organizers for uh, as, you know, asking me to uh, look and think about this paper. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Anand has said. And I, you know, sometimes the problem with going second is that it appears as if you're copying the guy who went first. But so I'm going to repeat some of what Anand said, but you know, <laughs> these are the points that I had noted. Not really, we weren't thinking that. <laughs> Uh, uh, I agree that this is a very interesting paper and a very interesting question and that, you know, I, I'm quite curious how you got the FIR data set and how you actually managed to put it together. So it would be nice in the paper also to get a description of how you collected the data set and whether it was given to you on a platter or did you have to hand collect it and do something to actually put it together and a little bit more detail on the sanctity of the data uh, because you know this data is notoriously difficult to get and so i'm very curious about uh, how you managed to pull that off so that's one comment on how you could improve uh, the writing in the paper and the information that you are uh, giving in um, the second point and i'm just going to you know kind of narrate the points as they as i noted them down uh, one interesting um, summary statistic if you have one, would be the difference uh, between the FIRs that come online versus offline. So are you able to distinguish between those that were reported online versus offline, both prior to the lockdown and post the lockdown? So that, again, will answer some of the questions that Anand has raised in terms of, you know, who is it that's reporting and are more reports coming online right is is has that has the mechanism changed uh, and related to that is the point on the delay uh, which is uh, has the time between when the event occurs and when the reporting occurs changed so you know is it that people are waiting and then reporting the crime and then can you make something so if there is a delay in the reporting of the crime then uh, the time when you note that the crime happened is actually different. So how do you, and maybe you already do that in your analysis, so it will be useful to clarify that as well, saying how do you differentiate between, I mean, has there been a delay in the reporting of the crime and can one make something out of that? From one of the graphs that you showed, uh, it seems to me that there is a threshold level of crime. And so mobility goes higher and higher, but the crime kind of stays. It was one of the earliest graphs that uh, you presented. And again, that was very interesting to me because it shows that there is some threshold level of crime in that economy or society. And um, once you get back to normal, you you end up at that threshold again. So all that the lockdown has done is that it has kept people home for some time. And so neither can the victims go out, but nor can the criminals go out. Uh, and hence you see this reduction and then it comes back to normal. Uh, so maybe all that is happening here is, you know, that people can't step out of their houses and hence there is no crime and then crime comes back. Uh, but then I'm not sure what policy implication I should draw from this because um, not stepping out is hardly a solution to anything, correct? So, I mean, one of the things that you say is that you want to reduce the criminal victim encounters, so to speak. Uh, but can, can is, that, is that really feasible? Is that something that we can really think of uh, in terms of, you know, is, is that even a mechanism to reduce crime um, in the true sense of the term? So I, I find myself a little nervous at what inference to draw from this finding. Uh, and 
and so I'd sort of leave it there and ask for your thoughts on this and maybe uh, the thoughts of other panelists as well. And another point that I thought which was uh, interesting was that, uh, you know, we see that there is an increase in property crimes uh, and that increase in property crimes also happens later. So you're kind of overcompensating for the property crimes that didn't happen during the lockdown. Um, the correct counterfactual really is that if you had a lockdown where there was no shock, there was no economic shock, there was no income loss, would then property crimes have been overcompensated? Uh, because here I think that there is, you're muddled a little bit, uh, as in the data is muddled, because there is an economic shock going on. And uh, I, I agree with Anand that, you know, just looking at unemployment rates may not be adequately be able to help you to disentangle why is it that property crimes are being overcompensated because maybe what's happening here is if there was no income shock and you just had a lockdown then property crimes would just come back to normal because earlier you could go and do some property crime now neither can you go out and if you are able to go out everybody else is staying at home so you're likelier to get caught Houses are not locked for the full day because all the neighbors are around and then it's that much harder to commit some kind of a property crime. Uh, and once that condition goes away, you go back to normal. But now you have this economic shock also combined. And, you know, is that the driver for an increase in property crimes? I think that perhaps you could use some nightlights data. Maybe that's some proxy for uh, economic growth. Um, maybe some a little bit more migration data that you could use uh, because where are these property crimes happening you know maybe those areas where there are more migrants no property crimes happen because that area is poorer to begin with so what kind of a property crime are you going to do when everybody around you is poor uh, and so can you kind of distinguish between some sort of an income differential uh, between these regions to figure out where is it that property crimes uh, have increased so not just in terms of uh, high uh, applicability of the lockdown versus low intensity of the lockdown, but also in terms of the economic activity in those regions. So maybe property crimes are happening in those regions where there is more economic activity because there is more to steal from in some ways. Uh, so I think uh, a little bit more digging into the whole property crime aspect and the disentangle, how you could disentangle income shocks versus just the lockdown effect driving these crimes. I think that would be interesting. And one final comment is, and I know you mentioned this in your presentation, which is that crime against women drops. And that really is surprising to me because we know that uh, a lot of crimes against women are committed by people that she knows. So even if it's not the family, it's, you know, somebody in your circle that is generally the perpetrator of the crime. And so why that should drop uh, is a bit of a puzzle to me. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm surprised by that result, to be honest. Um, so I, I'll just leave uh, it at that. And I wish you the very best for this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renuka Sane. Uh, what about uh, uh, we go now to uh, Dr. Arjun or Simi? What do you think that we take the questions from the audience or what do we do? Ma'am, we can go to Dr. Rubin to respond to, uh, to the discussant remarks or to the audience and including. Because there is one or two questions uh, from the, uh, uh, I can see in chat box. I would suggest that we take that also and then then request Dr. Ruben to uh, respond. Is that okay? Dr. Ruben, is that okay? So there is one kind of, uh, in the chat box, there is one kind of concern that during lockdown, children suffers a lot. Huh? And uh, the other request, of course, so their mental and physical violence against the small children also is very important. So there has been this kind of uh, inclusion besides um, uh, Dr. Renuka Sani said about the women's kind of thing. And I will also say something in my uh, concluding note, but uh, probably before that, we want to, to request you to, uh, to address these kind of what discussant have said and one, what this particular question has come with regard to uh, crimes against children. 
over to you, Dr. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for all the very insightful comments. It has been very productive already to, to be here in part of the discussion. Uh, you know, I think um, uh, all of the points are quite interesting and very, very good. Uh, so address the other points. So let, let me start like uh, going backwards. Uh, regarding the, 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 the uh, crimes of children, uh, I agree with that. Uh, something that actually surprised me a lot is that there's not much uh, uh, evidence uh, looking for how lockdown impacted uh, uh, abuse uh, against children. Uh, most of the domestic uh, violence paper are focused on, on violence against women. Uh, I was looking into that uh, at some point. Uh, unfortunately, um, the data from the FIR uh, have very few cases uh, uh, related with the uh, abuse against children. There's some acts uh, particularly going in that direction, but the, the, the cases are very, very uh, few. So basically you cannot do anything about it. Uh, the other option would be to use uh, data from coming from some NGO. However, uh, if under-reporting is an issue, is an issue for violence against women, uh, is a bigger issue for violence against children. Uh, so I think it's very, very uh, hard to uh, have a, a very clear impact of the lockdown that, unfortunately. Uh, for sure, there's, there, there should be something more to do in that direction, but it's, it's, very, it's very hard. Um, since I just mentioned the FRR data, uh, so in the case of Bihar, uh, this data is, is available in the online, okay? Uh, and can be great. Uh, for some other state, uh, this is also possible, but it's uh, much harder to do so because uh, there's some um, say prevention uh, to do so uh, in terms of the uh, captures and so on. Uh, for the case of the heart, it's not, a, it's not that hard to process that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some part of the data, and then so yes, so I cannot distinguish. Uh, that would be that's a good point, but I cannot distinguish which are made online. We were made online or in the police station. Uh, maybe I'll. I can do that for Delhi, but not for Bihar. And for Delhi, I don't have like, the whole data. <laughs> um, so, but that's uh, something that, uh, yeah, it's something to think about it. Uh, my, um, my perception is that most of this database, so most of the, uh, most of the um, reported crime are, are, are coming from people directly going to the deposit station. Uh, as also, uh, and I mentioned, uh, in the Bihar is a very poor state, right? Like, unfortunately, not many people have a lot of access to internet and so on. Let me, let me, can I just share briefly the one graph that I couldn't show, which is related to, uh, where's that? Can you see me in my slides? Yeah. So this, yes, yes this we can is see. The, the, the graph related to, the delays uh, in reporting. And yeah, so uh, 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 this is basically, uh, as you can see, like at the, the first line, right, is a moment of the position of the lockdown. And the number of delays uh, once the position of the lockdown started uh, decreased. Uh, my perception about this is that most of the people were staying at home. So they didn't have any other activity that can uh, be more they didn't have much to do, right? So the opportunity of, of, of time was severely decreased uh, during the lockdown. Something that would be interesting, and I haven't done it, is to see how this uh, varies across different type of crime. My perception, or at least what I would expect to see, is that for, for severe crimes such as murder, there, would, there shouldn't be any, any, any change, right? If you observe right, this event, what, probably most of all the people will go directly and report to the police right away instead of just waiting. So probably like the, the, the changes in, in, in delay and reporting were higher in, in, in some crimes such as this, for instance. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the, 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 the what, what date I use for the, for the paper, I use the date of the, uh, of the day of the incident, okay? Not the day of the reporting. Because uh, the reporting, as you were saying, there, there might be some delay. So all the analysis uh, was based on the on the, on the incident date. Uh, regarding the optimal level crime, yes, I agree with that. 
every society have a unfortunately a, well has a positive uh, level of um, crime uh, and yes most of the as you were seeing like they were like returning to uh, the optimal level if my I would guess if perhaps we have a longer term span uh, property crimes will after the overshooting will go back again to the to the steady state uh, crime level. Um, what else I have? Um, ah, in terms of the policy implications, yes, that's a good point. So in terms of the policy implications, I think that's why it's important to try to understand why what is the main mechanism, right? Uh, the mechanism uh, that can explain the, this large reduction uh, is the probability of a, a criminal victim encounter, right? And uh, defined in a broad way, right? In this particular setting would be basically that there kind of like there's kind of be a physical interaction between criminals and perpetrators right uh, mostly driven by not many victims uh, potential victims in the street rather than many criminals going in the street okay um the if it were for criminal it's very easy it's, it's related more to incapacitation in terms of imprisonment however a policy cannot be less everybody stay at home Right? That, that, that's not possible. It is possible only in the case of curfews. And I think at least in that regard, uh, if you're observing a, a large search of uh, criminal cases, a curfew would be a, a very uh, useful way to prevent and stop all this criminal, criminal, uh, criminal activity. So I think that would be a positive implication in that sense. Uh, however, I think like other type of policies that con can go in line to decrease in some way the probability that a potential bit it can be in the same place with a potential uh, perpetrator could go in, in the same direction. Uh, what is the best optimal way to do so is, uh, is hard to tell. Uh, I think it would be very useful to have a, a clear understanding of uh, uh, what are the most likely victims for certain type of criminal cases. So service about, uh, service about uh, victimization uh, might be pro might provide us uh, uh, about what are the most uh, important characteristics to recognize what are the most likely victims. And in there, uh, for those people, right, potentially uh, create certain type of uh, policies that might reduce the chances that they are super exposed uh, to, uh, to perpetrators. Um, however, I think the other part uh, in terms of uh, what uh, the dynamics of crime I think all this provides us some new insight that we didn't, didn't have in the literature. Uh, there was no nothing uh, related about how uh, criminals behave, intertemporally speaking. Okay, particularly uh, most of the most of the analysis is static. What we find is that uh, preventing personal crimes, murder, kidnapping, this kind of crimes, now there is no will be of the, the won't be overcompensated in the future. Okay, and that's something that we didn't know before. And this is very interesting in terms of how uh, criminals uh, behave and, and what are the motives for this type of crimes. So most of these kind of crimes are, are crimes of passion, right? Uh, which are basically uh, committed in the heat of the moment, and particularly with people that you, you know, okay? So if there's any way of preventing those crimes, right? There's a net, there's a positive effect uh, on our society. And that's something that we don't observe for uh, property crimes. Now, as both of you suggest, uh, it's very, very hard um, to be able to disentangle mechanisms in the long term, right? Because particularly a lot of things were changing, right? During the, uh, as the lockdown progress. Um, with the part of the, with the, I, I, I don't think we can rule out completely the, the, the fact that uh, a lot of this overshooting is driven by um, by new criminals uh, engaging in crime. I don't think we can do that. What I try to do is to compare districts in terms of unemployment rates, as I said before, uh, and in terms of the amount of migrants that uh, uh, came along uh, in the districts. Um, in terms of the unemployment, yes, uh, something that happened in Bihar, uh, the, the, I was using the, the data from uh, CMIAE, uh, and then the unemployment rate severely increased in Bihar during the period of the lockdown, uh, more than uh, 40% uh, within a month. Uh, 
yes, I have to think about like whether there's other ways to disentangle new equipment. I was thinking, I don't know if you have any other suggestion about the ones that you mentioned. Um, it's really hard to geolocate the, the type of crimes. So I think it would be hard to go in that margin, but something that would be another option maybe would be uh, uh, analyzing uh, who are the people who were arrested and see whether they, these are the same individuals that were arrested before or, or new type of individuals to see the, whether there are new people uh, engaging in, in criminal activity. I haven't done that. Maybe that's a potential uh, area to explore. Uh, I don't know whether it, it would be uh, fruitful or not. Um, yes, in terms of the using the delays, as a correction for the estimation, yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. That's that, that's a good point. I, I don't know exactly how to be able to do it, but I can I can take a look. In terms of data from youth employment, I, uh, is there any data in the district level for that matter? If that's the case, that would be really really good to to, to analyze. So maybe if any of you have like a, a some direction that says I, I think that could be. Useful and, and also income inequality. Yeah, I, I can use that uh, to serve the district. Um, do I have anything else to cover? Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah. But thank you. Thank you for your comments. Honestly, they are very useful. And thank you, Dr. Ruben. You have covered most of the point. I also have some points, Dr. Ruben. I was thinking that how do you define crime? There can be crime and there can be offense if you take the legal term. And it would be important that you must draw your parameter. Every crime or uh, every crime is cannot be a crime and every offense also cannot be a crime. So when you define that either you take legal term or you take the social term in your analysis, analytical, that was, I was looking for that and I didn't find that. Second is also why the delays happen. I mean, the, there were some crimes, but why did the delay happen? It was because of the lockdown or because of the particular, you, you probably think that it was because of the lockdown, but we would like to know the definite reasons for that. Third is really, who were these people who were arrested? People were arrested, but more important I'm looking for why they were arrested. And then really tells you the nature of the crime. So recording kind of, the police data can be very fuzzy. Um, that it would be the, and uh, so murder is not the only crime. Uh, close to kind of what would be the other kind of crimes that you were looking. And if you are looking for murders, then say that th this is the definition of your murder and other things. Um, um, and then there was also kind of some interaction is necess was necessary with the called the shadow reports or the reports that are produced, they were also being produced. People were writing also uh, during that time, NGO or afterwards. For example, what are the things that people were in, in a kind of half, half serious uh, note, I can say the criminals were sitting at home and beating the women. And this is how the report has come. Why the violence globally increased against women during this period? There are two kinds of data that are, and they are available, that increased care work of women, tremendous increase, taking care of children, taking care of elderly, meeting the demands of the uh, elderly uh, parents and the husbands kind of thing, they still wanted the hot food and uh, clean house and all that goes with it, the whole package. And if it was not given, then women were first shouted and they were beating. That is the... Now, is beating a crime or not kind of thing? So they may not go to report to the police, but to say that crimes did not happen, one, I find it very difficult. And, and this crime, I think, in countries like France, Europe also is increased. I don't have the data for Netherlands, but Netherlands also reported increase in crime. You are based in Netherlands, I just thought, kind of thing, maybe. But in, in India, it is doubled. And these were the conservative estimates. And nobody questions this kind of data because women did not go for reports. But where do you go for reporting kind of thing? There was question of hungry children and hungry people. 
And the, in the Madhya Pradesh, I was asking with Samanji or Pradhan, who were probably must have heard, that why, what, in your opinion, what was the reason that were these kinds of so much beating up of the women happened? And they said three reasons. One was that uh, not taking care of the elderly parents. So husband would get very angry that you are not taking good care of the children crying, second reason. That you can't you manage children, can't you keep uh, kind of this thing and then, then slapping was a minor thing and more kind of beating happened. And third was the kind of hot food. Hot food was not available. So in that kind of, maybe in that kind of boredom, you wanted hot food, but men did not really took care of themselves producing hot food. However, in some cities, there are reports men started sharing some work, helping uh, probably they called helping the women. Uh, so it is women's work, so you help. It is not the men's work that, uh, and women's work. Everybody's work that if you, if you are eating, you should be cooking also, we know that. Mm. So now in this helping of the work, uh, housework, what happened was there were all kinds of disparaging humor started. People were on social media, on, um, I read a paper in economic and politically, I was really surprised to see that. So this humor has two full. One humor was between the maid, the house worker whom they hired and between the maid. There would be the, uh, sorry, house worker and the employee and employer, you can say that. So a housekeeper would, they say that employee, the house, um, the house owner, she went to meet the um, uh, maid, they use the word maid, I don't like to use that anyway. She went to meet the maid and the maid was wearing good sari and putting lipstick and all this. This is the humor that is kind of thing. And the house owner says that I came to see her and I was in poor kind of uh, chappals, chappals are slippers, and I had torn sari, and I had not done any makeup on me. I was my hands were kind of soiled hands. All this kind of description, this kind of disparaging. So one was this kind of humor. Other kind of humor, humor was, oh, our man has become really feminine man. They are he's not doing anything. He's just going to do the kind of housework. So there was a joke, this kind of thing that uh, the man reports that I wanted to call my boss and the boss called me, sorry, boss called me and woman answered and she said, he's cooking. So I'll tell him to I call you later. Then boss, he didn't call. So boss said that, why didn't you call me? He said, I called you, but the, your wife said that you are washing the utensils. Look at this kind of the joke that kind of went around and looking down of this rise in masculinity, which leading to crime. So I think if your definition of the crime can be more nuanced, that will be really good. That, that would kind of give a lot of strength to your paper. So this was, I was thinking that this is still a puzzle, that why the kind of uh, the numbers are coming, people are debating, and after that, a lot of attention has been drawn to increase care work and it should be recognized and there are kind of attempts being made to assess it and recognize it. But the question is, uh, during lockdown, it became very, very evident. Uh, and uh, so it was really not a kind, maybe your thesis applies in my mind, that social interaction is stopped outside in the public spaces, but it, it condensed in the, at home and then they began to indulge in crime they began to be children they began to beat the women because they were so role of not only crime of passion but crime of power will be also important and expression and manifestation within home will be very important to look at this at least you acknowledge the problem i mean if we cannot really bypass the situation because we can say that this problem was there. I did not find the data. I did not do this. Every paper has limits. But if you don't say anything about it, then, then there is a problem. So thank you so much. But otherwise it has been fantastic presentation, fantastic discussion, and I enjoyed and learned every, every bit of it. Thank you very much. Perfect, thanks. Actually, let me, let, can I just say something please, about the, the, the please, point please. you mentioned? Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it, I think it's quite important. And actually, I'm working in another project, uh, specifically looking on the uh, domestic violence. 
uh, and how these have been evolving in India in the last few years, and particularly what are the consequences of the low down in the long term. Uh, one of the biggest problems about that is that uh, once you start say uh, when these events occur, it's more likely to that this occurs in the future. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a that's a very important concern. Uh, and yes, the only problem with that is like uh, measuring this is, is quite hard. So for instance, for this other project, we're looking at data from uh, the National Com Commission of Women mm -hmm. uh, to see how this has been evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can I can just share the, the, the screen just for one second. Uh, so here uh, there is uh, data uh, coming from that source mm -hmm. uh, and separating the type of uh, well different type of uh, of offenses like like yeah. these mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, something that is, is is quite interesting is that at, at the very beginning. The, there is a, a decrease in at the beginning of the imposition of the law. By the way, this is data for all India, not for the for mm -hmm. the right? So, at least in, at the national level, the the, the law started like 25th of March. So for some straight before at least, but there is a, a reduction in, in domestic violence uh, near, close to the, the period of the lockdown. Uh, however, uh, this has been increasing afterwards. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the data yet to see what happened in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something uh, that we want to explore, as, as you mentioned. Very, very interesting, very important, yeah. Mm -hmm. Arjun or Simi, please. Uh... Uh, Dr. Arjun. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, we have um, uh, Sahiba Imran also. She has raised her hand. If uh, we could have her on the screen. Sure, I did not see that. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, ma'am. Oh. Yes, uh, Sahiba, talking is permitted. If you could just uh, present your question. Yes, Sahiba. Thank you for allowing, ma'am. Uh, it's not a question as such, but uh, since I'm working on a, a PhD topic uh, related to women prisoners, I come across many legal terms and uh, very rightly, ma'am pointed out, uh, definition of crime is very gender biased. So when the base is itself not, you know, in a secular form, in a rational form, uh, obviously the building on which uh, we have make it, that is also lacking that uh, nuances in it. And uh, there are, uh, I mean, uh, legally man, woman are uh, same, but socially they are not. But while uh, taking into account the criminal behavior of an individual, it is very different for a man and it is very different for a woman. And uh, I'm more uh, working in my project, I'm working more on the impact on uh, woman uh, imprisonment uh, uh, and its impact on their dependent children. And uh, it is very, you know, uh, uh, disturbing to share that when a man in, is inside the prison, uh, yes, there is an impact on the family in a very negative term. But when a mother is not there at home, you won't believe how uh, pathetic condition a child is going on. That is one thing. And another thing, uh, man criminalization or imprisonment has, uh, has a stigma, but not as woman has. So this submission I want to make on the basis of the thing I have read till now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saira. Very important. Uh. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. So actually something that you mentioned, uh, what I'm, at least for my paper, what I'm using is just like the, the legal definition in terms of uh, what I'm using is uh, basically the Indian penal codes to classify the, all, the, all the crimes. Uh, yes, there might be some uh, uh, biases, right, in how the, the, the law is written. I cannot do anything about that to correct that. In terms, for instance, for the, for violence against women, uh, I'm looking for, um, uh, let me say, uh, well, I don't have like all the Indian penal codes. Uh, for instance, the most common one, as I said before, is assault of criminal force to women with intent to outrage her modesty. That covers, uh, at least from the data from the police, uh, about 70 percent uh, but uh, there's also other acts 
uh, that are related in that category. I don't have the data at the moment to to really uh, tell you which one were were related, but basically everything that is related with with female uh, or certain acts against um, marriage, those are, are included in this in this in in this. But yes, basically the, the, the one of the biggest problems, particularly with this state type of data uh, regarding crime against women, uh, is is there is the under reporting for sure. Simi. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rubin, for your uh, response. So, uh, Professor Govind, uh, can we start with the way forward round? We could begin with uh, the discussions. That's fine. Yes, yeah, sure. Mm. So, uh, this time, Dr. Renuka Sane. So, she, the doctor, <laughs> she, the, can we say that what would be the way forward? I will start with the discussion first and then come to Dr. Rubin. What should be the way forward? I, mean, I, I wish Rubin the best of luck in sort of improving the paper that uh, uh, he has already presented. I think you've got some interesting set of comments from uh, all the people pre present here today. Um, so in terms of the paper, I think there is some direction uh, on where to go. In terms of uh, the larger context of crime and crimes against women and how to measure what drives crime. I think in India, we are only at the start of uh, more quantitative literature on these questions, partly because uh, I, I'm delighted to hear that a lot of this data is available online and we could scrape it. I didn't know. Uh, and perhaps more research can be done trying to find many correlates of, of crime with other things. Uh, not to, I mean, I, I kind of want to emphasize the quant research aspect of it because I know that many people who work on the ground actually do have an idea of what is going on. But economists and quantitative social scientists have probably not uh, translated that into a, a, a very deep uh, research uh, literature in India. So I think uh, this probably is the starting point or, you know, it, it encourages us to do a little bit more in trying to understand the dynamics of crime and uh, what drives it and how we can reduce it, uh, what effects it has on people. Uh, so many, many questions uh, in this space uh, for all of us to pursue. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ranan Srivastava. Thanks, and now going second, I'm going to repeat everything that Renuka said. But uh, uh, yeah, Ruben, fantastic work. I think uh, uh, you know this paper. I think it will will turn out well. But I was also delighted to see that you're also working on the uh, domestic violence work, and I think it will be very important to see, you know, taking both of these things together, how uh, uh, you know lockdown impacted, uh, 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 you know, the entire kind of situation of crime uh, in the country, but specifically. Uh, uh, against women, and I think it's they should. Uh, this is part of, as as Anuka said, an increasing amount of quantitative work uh, 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 in this area. And I think uh, uh, a lot more needs to be done. You know, uh, I know that each paper has to have a policy uh, uh, kind of uh, part. So you 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 have made that, but I think the actual kind of any kind of policy thing will come from a body of work which will actually uh, require a lot of papers and many more people working on this and give us a comprehensive understanding of what exactly is going on and, and some kind of concrete policy recommendations will, will come out of it. So uh, I wish you all the best uh, uh, in, in, in this work. Thank you. Any other suggestion from anyone? Otherwise, I don't want to have a last word, but I have to say something. We could have Dr. Rubin, uh, his views. Dr. Rubin, uh, let me tell you also, not as a chair, but as a kind of participant. I think you are in a very good kind of uh, frame of point uh, because you have already seems uh, collecting data, uh, available data on violence against women, and you have the framework. So this paper has a great potential in my mind uh, after today's discussion to develop into a good paper in terms of women inclusive kind of thing. So that we don't want you to drop the other data or other analysis, but you can do the, that data plus you include this also. That would be that to the extent possible. Thank you. Now, please, up to you. 
over to you. No, I want to just uh, thank uh, everybody for the, the very insightful comments. I really appreciate this. Uh, yes, I, for instance, like uh, the idea uh, in the larger agenda would be to uh, try to gather as much possible data in this kind of domestic violence, not only uh, including women, uh, but also analyzing children, if possible. We, uh, we have been having difficulties in, in that direction. Uh, but uh, the idea would be to uh, study these cases for a longer period of span, uh, at least uh, 15 years, uh, and see how this has evolved uh, across different states, uh, districts, and, and particularly how the impact uh, of, of lockdown affected. Like the, it has been already almost two years since the beginning, and we don't know how the how families are coping nowadays. Whether the the people that suffer, women that suffer, basically. Uh, domestic violence are still re uh, recurring with these events or not. So, so I think this is a, a project on its own uh, and hopefully we're gonna get a, some policy implications to improve the, the, the lives of these people. Simi. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruben, for uh, those uh, concluding thoughts. And certainly, uh, this this uh, entire deliberation has been very important and very uh, passionate responses from all of uh, um, you, including uh, Dr. Rubin, uh, Dr. Renuka, Dr. Anand, and uh, uh, Professor Govin. Uh, thank you very much for presenting your views. And absolutely, uh, the points that have been raised is very, very uh, are very, very significant. I would uh, uh, like to. Uh, invite uh, Govind, ma'am. Ma'am, would you like to present your concluding remarks? Uh, if you have any, uh, Govind, ma'am. I have already said uh, okay. what okay. is there in my uh, analysis was there that um, we really enjoyed your framework. I have not had many kind of discussions with this kind of thing. And your theory, I do believe in the theoretical analysis kind of thing that. Um, how the social interaction kind of uh, behaves kind of thing that, uh, and this is a puzzle to me, as I said, that um, uh, we are a social being and they, I, every year, uh, every day I read about um, uh, this thing that people who are interacting only through laptop and other things, and that is not as creative and as thought provoking as the personal interaction would be. Uh, uh, there are kind of technologists who are saying this and there are other social scientists also who are saying this. So, uh, uh, but uh, so that is the, so, uh, but in the same social kind of network, then you see that people also behave kind of in the, in a being uh, attacking each other, various kind of crimes that would be important to, so within home when they concentrated or they created that kind of social interaction at home, then they began to be violent, more violent than they were earlier, that kind of thing. So this crimes of power and passion, of course, crime is related to kind of not a different kind of power expression is also major feature in the kind of being, uh, introducing criminality in mind, that what is important because he's the, he is the very powerful at home kind of thing, the person who comes home. So but women and children both suffer in terms of, for one reason or another. That is the, so that would be, and you are collecting data. So already, I mean, analysis uh, would be important. Uh, the other thing is that we would like very much for you, as I said uh, earlier, and which you agreed that we want your parameters of what is crime. Hmm? that uh, we don't want really the police definition of the crime or the state definition of crime, but a researcher like you saying, what do you think is the crime during this kind of thing? Because it may be murder, rape is a crime, but to me, I mean, this kind of condition of women and children when they are doing something, this is also crime, eh? we say what kind of crime. So just as a kind of researcher, we would, uh, I would request you to do this kind of thing. Having said that, it is a kind of great paper and you have the great potential. So thank you. Look forward to your completed uh, paper on this thing. And the discussant remarks have been very, very important in terms of giving the suggestions, both of Renuka Sane and also Anand Srivastav's. 
So that is also one of the uh, but, uh, uh, enrich your paper. And I personally gained a lot from your analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you every member of the audience and uh, raising these questions. I wish there are more questions were coming, but at this time and the, with the onset of the winter, people are a bit in a hurry to go, <laughs> to wind up. Not only, I can't say to go home because they may be sitting at home, but to wind up. Thank you. Simi, now you can continue. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Govind, ma'am, for your wonderful concluding thoughts. And uh, so I would like to uh, propose a formal vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center um, uh, on the topic asymmetric crime dynamics and uh, social interactions. Dr. Rubin, you have provided your wonderful insights and we really uh, thank you and wish you all the best for your paper as you complete and also for your upcoming work on uh, domestic violence. I would also like to thank our discussants for the uh, session, Dr. Anand Srivastav and Dr. Renuka Sani. And most of all, our Professor uh, Govind Kelkar, the chair of the session. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful, for chairing this wonderful session and for presenting your thoughts as well. And also thank you to Sahiba and also to all the other attendees uh, here on uh, Zoom and also on Facebook Live. Thank you to all those who would be watching us later on YouTube and listening to our podcasts. Thank you, and I wish you all a very good day. Thank you so much. Thank you.